Assalamu alaikum everyone. So today's session is session number four in the tafsir of Surah Yasin. Uh, we finished we finished talking about the first 27 ayahs and we're still in part one of the surah so the next four ayahs will complete part one and then we'll go into part two so today we'll do first we'll do um, four or five ayahs from ayah number 28 to ayah number 32 in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وما أنزلنا على قومه من بعده من جند من السماء وما كنا منزلين So as you recall, we finished, last week we finished the story of أصحاب القرية the dwellers of the town. And as you recall, Surah Yasin is called Qalbul Qur'an, the heart of the Qur'an. Because it contains the essential teachings of Islam. It contains teachings regarding the prophethood of the Prophet wasallam, specifically as it leads to the hereafter as it leads to resurrection. So it talks about prophethood, it talks about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his existence and his attributes, and it talks about resurrection, it talks about the day of judgment. And these are the basic teachings of Islam. So when we recite it over our dead, when we recite it over those who are approaching death, we are reminding them of the teachings of Islam. We are reminding them and reminding ourselves of the essential teachings of Islam. So when they leave this world, they leave this world with full conviction. So in these five ayahs, we have now, it's like comments on what happens after the story of Ashab al -Qariya. And the first ayah goes like this: "وَمَا أَنْزَلْنَا عَلَى قَوْمِهِ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ مِنْ جُنْدٍ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ وَمَا كُنَّا مُنْزِلِينَ." Nor sent we down on his people just after him. Who is him? Is this person who came from Aqsa al-Madinati, who came from the farthest uh, part of the town, to declare his iman and to declare his Islam and to say, "Ya qawmi tabi'ul mursaleen." nor sent we down on his people just after him any legions from the sky because they killed him they killed him they stoned him and killed him in a very horrible way so what was the result of that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says nor sent we down on his people just after him any legions from the sky nor ever would we win, nor ever would we need to. So after him, we did not send, we did not send down Jund, hosts, from heaven against his people. Nor would we send down. That's not our sunnah. That's not our style. So this ayah is answering a hypothetical question also because after we hear the story we start wondering what's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going to do to these people perhaps he punished them with lightning perhaps he punished them with thunder perhaps he sent legions or battalion of angels against them And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَنزَلْنَا وَمَا أَنزَلْنَا He said, we don't do this. That's not our style. That's not our sunnah. To send a battalion of, of soldiers or a battalion of angels or host or legions. 
if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wished to destroy a town, one angel is sufficient. We don't need a battalion. One angel is sufficient. وَمَا كُنَّا مُنْزِلِينَ i.e. this is not our هَذَا لَيْسَ شَأْنُنَا this is not our style, this is not our habit, this is not our custom, this is not our sunnah. Because if that was the case, anytime we send prophet to people and people don't believe in this prophet, they get punished right away. That's not the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sunnah of Allah is umli lahum fa inna kaydi mateen. The sunnah of Allah is that he postpones their punishment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not an emotional God that as soon as they go against his teachings, they get destroyed. He is not someone like, like us. We, sometimes we react emotionally. If someone does something bad to me, immediately I, want, I act on impulse. The creator of the heavens and the earth, that's not his style. His style is there is a day of judgment and there is a yawmul maw'ud and there is a point beyond which people get destroyed because of their sins because that was the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But his decree and the way he deals with people is not based on impulse. And it's not just because they denied their prophet. I.e. al-hisab wa al-iqab laysa al-an judgment and taking people to account is not now. It's going to happen. There's a time for it. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wished to destroy a town, uh, his sunnah is one angel is sufficient. One angel is sufficient i.e. they're not worthy of sending a battalion of angels. One angel is sufficient to destroy all humanity, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so wishes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did send thousands of angels in the battle of Badr, but the intent of sending those angels was not to destroy everyone. It was just tasbitan al-mu'mineen, to support the believers. The believers were the ones that uh, conducted the Battle of Badr, which is a decisive battle in the history of Islam. In verse 29, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنْ كَانَتْ إِلَّا صَيْحَةً وَاحِدًا إِنْ كَانَتْ إِلَّا صَيْحَةً وَاحِدًا Not was it but a single cry, i.e. it was but a single cry. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes to destroy people, an angel making a single cry would be sufficient to destroy people. It was but a single cry, and lo, they were extinguished. I.e. with a single cry, then behold, they are extinguished. And he emphasized it by saying wahida. In kanat illa sayhatan wahida. So it's, it doesn't have to be repeated. Some people get destroyed with, with a loud sound by the angel. فَإِذَا هُمْ خَامِدُونَ فَإِذَا هُمْ خَامِدُونَ So, as a result of this sayha, إِنْ كَانَتْ إِلَّا صَيْحَةً وَاحِدَةً فَإِذَا هُمْ خَامِدُونَ And lo, they were extinguished. Here, the metaphor is that the people of the town and people like them They're like a fire. And a fire 
it's very hot and keeps on growing and keeps on becoming majestic, referring to their arrogance and the way they treated the, the believers. And then it says, فَإِذَا هُمْ خَامِدُونَ as a result of this single cry, فَإِذَا هُمْ خَامِدُونَ It indicates how quickly their fire was extinguished. How quickly they were destroyed. And this, these letters, خُمُود, the word خَامِدُونَ indicates سُكُونٌ بَعْدَ فَوَرَانٌ indicates extinguishing after it was majestic. To refer that these people, because they were part of the Byzantium Empire, these people were very strong, very powerful. They have military might, they have technology, they have a political might, and all of their strengths and all of their might is gone with a single cry. Or this would be this could refer to any group of people and that the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will happen later, i.e. when a single cry takes them. And this would refer to the day of judgment. The day of judgment has two sides. The first side, Nufiha Fisurim, the first blow. And the second side, when it's blown in the trumpet a second time. So the punishment would come at that time. In the first time, when Nufi Khafis Suri, Fasai Kaman Fis Samawati Woman Filard. Illa man sha Allah. So Manufi Khafihi Ukra Faiza Hum Qiyamun Yanzurun. This is in Surah Zumar, chapter 39, verse 68. At that time, everyone will be taken into account. At that time, resurrection will take place. And this idea that in kanat illa sayhatan wahida will be repeated in the surah. This could be also an answer to a hypothetical question. Because many of us think, like, look, in this world, the disbelievers are having a good time. They're very powerful. They're enjoying their life. And there is no punishment for them. So why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so patient with them? Someone might ask. Why is God so patient with the people of the earth? These verses answer this question. There were people who were more mighty than those people. There were people who were more arrogant than those people. And Allah SWT did not destroy them right away, but gave them time and gave them time and gave them time. And in this world, In Surah Al-Isra, Allah SWT says, we will give to people who believe, we will give to people who disbelieve. But the giving of your Lord is not exclusive to one party over another. When the right time comes, everyone will, will have to answer for their, for their deeds. Because what's the wisdom behind this? Because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to destroy people just because they disobey him, or destroy people just because they denied his prophets, then the day of judgment would have happened thousands of years ago. Because on, on the face of this earth, most people don't deserve for life to continue. Now, if you look at the Muslims, the Muslims are in bad shape. And many Muslims even work against their own religion. And other people, they don't care. Verse number 30 emphasizes this point further, where it says, يَا حَسْرَةً عَلَى الْعِبَادِ 
يا حسرة على العباد ما يأتيهم من رسول إلا كانوا به يستهزئون Alas for the servants The word that is used here is hasra. Hasra implies sorrow, implies it's a state that envelops the heart when you regret your action, you regret doing a certain act, and you know that it cannot be, خلاص, it's done. You cannot go back and, 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 and repair what you did. And as a result, you, you feel remorse, you feel regret. So this state that envelops the heart because of the pain, when you realize this, you feel pain. And it's very painful, but you can't go back to repair what you've done. So, ya hasratan ala al-ibad, that if you look at the state of the affairs of most people on earth, uh, they're in a state that invites hasra, invites the prophets and those beliefs to feel sorry for them. Because once it's gone, it's gone. And the word ya, yeah, it came here, ya hasratan ala libad, is to emphasize this point. Lil mubalagha, as they say. Ya hasratan ala libad, and by ibad here, servants, it is not meant servants who obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it's meant servant that have gone outside the sphere of abudiyah, the sphere of servitude i.e. anyone who denied their prophets, i.e. all of those people that were destroyed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then it says, مَا يَأْتِيهِمْ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا كَانُوا بِهِ يَسْتَهْزِئُونَ It's so as, you know, as soon as the prophet come, that's their reaction. Their reaction is to mock the prophet and to mock the message and to mock whoever sent the message. As we mentioned before, last week or the week before, when he said, Ma antum illa basharun muslim. We think you're lying. You're just mere humans like us. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did send the Prophet, he must be an angel. And because you're humans, he must be lying. Ma yatihim min rasulin illa kanu bihi yastahzi'un. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in ayah number 31 says, أَلَمْ يَرَوْ كَمْ أَهْلَكْنَا قَبْلَهُمْ مِنَ الْقُرُونِ أَنَّهُمْ إِلَيْهِمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ Don't they see? Have they not seen how many a generation before them we laid waste? So never to them shall they return. In verse 31, have they not considered how many generations before them we destroyed such that they return not unto them? Alam yaraw. The verb that is used here is a verb see. Don't they see? And by seeing, it is not meant to see with the eye i.e. don't they know, i.e. if they were to travel in the earth, they will see this through anthropology, through many things. It's, these are facts. These are historical facts and people can see how many generations, how many civilizations were destroyed. And what's left today is just remnants of those civilizations. أَلَمْ يَرَوْ كَمْ أَهْلَكْنَا قَبْلَهُمْ مِنَ الْقُرُونِ have they not considered, have they not seen? And by seeing here, it means knowledge. Don't they know what happened to other generations before them that were destroyed? So this is a question. 
But this question is a rhetorical question. Hmm? And it's a rhetorical question. It's, it's when you tell your child, didn't I give you a gift last week? Didn't I raise you? It's called istifham taqriri. Or in the Quran it says, Alam naj'ali al-arda mihada? Istifham taqriri. You ask a question to someone and you give them an opportunity to respond. Then they realize that they cannot respond except in the affirmative. You give them an opportunity to deny, but they cannot deny. So they have to agree with what you're saying. And it's very powerful because now the agreeing is coming from them. You're not telling them what needs to be done. They're admitting it on their own. Alam yaraw kam ahlakna qablahum min al qurun. And with this istifham taqriri comes also the idea of scolding. Like, I did not expect this from you. When you tell your child something, didn't I raise you? Didn't I give you this? Didn't I give you this? So how could you do that? It's like you're saying, I did not expect these things from someone like you. And same thing here. Alam yaraw. You, people of the earth, are rational people. You can think. You can reflect. This is not expected of you to, like, ignore all these facts. أَنَّهُمْ إِلَيْهِمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ أَلَمْ يَرَوْ كَمْ أَهْلَكْنَا كَمْ كَمْ implies كَثْرَ هَذِي كَمْ لِلْتَكْسِيرَ It implies how many generations? Like so many. أَنَّهُمْ إِلَيْهِمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ Don't they see that these people, once they die, they cannot go back to life again? We have these ideas today that, especially in the Far East, in many places, especially with postmodernism, superstition is becoming, is gaining momentum. And people think that after we die, we're going to be in a better place. After we die, our soul will hover for 49 days before it settles down. And after we die, if our souls has been wrong, they try to avenge others. And you have dramas and movies that talk about these things, or sorceries, where you invite people from the other side to join into your Zoom conversation. Says, are you there? Can you hear me? Hmm? So, it's saying here, they can never go back. Nor are there any of them but shall be massed all together before us, brought to judgment. I.e., each of them shall be group arraigned before us. Each of them. All of them will be brought back, and all of them will be brought back to judgment. Someone asked, I think, last time or a few times, the idea of tankir. In kullun. Kullun is, a, is an indefinite word. And sometimes we read in the surahs, in the ayat, there's always tankir, a word that, that are mentioned without the definite article. In Arabic, the idea of using indefinite words with tanween on them at the end it's because the Arabs they love omission 
they love to omit words. They love to omit meanings. And in language, this is risky. When you omit meanings, you're allowing your words to be misunderstood. But the Arabic language has a sophisticated system where words can be omitted and there are guidelines how to fill in the blanks. Ibn Jinni, one of the scholars of the Arabic language, used to call this Shaja'atul Arabiya, the courage of the Arabic language. is to omit things and by omitting, omitting meanings or words, you replace all these meanings with an indefinite article. To indicate to you, use your mind and find out what's been omitted. So sometimes a definite article acts as a substitution for omitting meanings and words. Like here. وَإِن كُلٌّ كُلٌّ Instead of saying, كُلُّ كَذَا وَكَذَا Every this and this and this and this and this. كُلٌّ And your mind will have to be at work to find out what it's referring to. وَإِن كُلٌّ لَمَّا جَمِيعٌ لَدَيْنَا مُحْضَرُونَ So, this verse is indicating that all human beings, believers and disbelievers alike, will be brought to judgment on the day of judgment and will be arraigned on the day of judgment. And the word that is used also is muhdarun. Muhdarun is ism maf'ul, is a passive participle. If I were to say, fulan was brought to judgment, brought, it's a passive word, brought, i.e. he had no choice. He cannot say, I cannot be, I don't want to come to the day of judgment. وَإِن كُلٌّ لَمَّا جَمِيعٌ لَدَيْنَا مُحْضَرُونَ They'll be brought, whether they like it or not, they'll be brought. It has no relationship with their choice. They'll be compelled to come. So this completes part one of the surah. And part one began with talking about Yasin wal Quran al Hakim, innaka lamin al Mursaleen. Began talking about the Prophet and prophethood. And talked about the essence of his message that he is Nazir, he is a warner, he, one, he is one who gives ty uh, glad tidings. And talked about what happens to those who uh, react to the message in one way or another. And gave us a story of the, the Ashab al Qarya, the dwellers of the town. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent two messengers and then added a third. And the people of the town ridiculed them and argued against them. And how the messengers articulated their message and how someone from the same city who is a man of position because he's able to talk to the elders as equal came and supported the messengers and then we read the five ayahs that conclude that part in part two we see now a different scene we see now shift to a focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his attributes of perfection and that he is full of alim and full of izza and full of hikmah he is the all wise the almighty the all knowing and all the other attributes of perfection but it talks about these attributes in a way that's relevant to the topic at hand which is supporting the prophethood of the prophets as well as talking about Resurrection Day. 
So in this part two, we see first three signs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave three signs. وَمِنْ آيَاتِ أَوْ وَآيَةٌ لَهُمْ Sign number one goes from verse 33 to 36. And then the second sign goes from verse 37 to 40. And the third sign goes from verse 41 to 44. After the three signs are mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned two things. And he began these two things by saying, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ when they're told. And then mention the third thing, and they say, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا So three signs to support the prophets and messengers and to also give us proofs about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his attributes. And then talks about what the humanity were told and how some of them respond and in the last ayah so when they're told goes from 45 to 46 and also in verse 47 and they say it goes from verse 48 to 50 so that that's part two of the sword so let's begin with sign one قال تعالى وآية لهم الأرض الميتة أحييناها وأخرجنا منها حبا فمنه يأكلون and a mighty sign to them is the dead dry earth we have revived and brought forth from it wondrous grain and brought forth from it wondrous grain so of it, they may eat. So that's the first sign. A sign unto them is a dead earth. They see it in front of them. It's dead. When there is a drought or famine, you see everything is dead. And the trees, they look like rocks. There's no life in them whatsoever. They look like inanimate objects. The earth is dry. We revive it and bring forth grain from this, uh, from the earth, that they may eat thereof. That's the first sign. وَجَعَلْنَا فِيهَا جَنَّاتٍ مِنْ نَخِيلٍ وَأَعْنَابٍ وَفَجَّرْنَا فِيهَا مِنَ الْعُيُونَ And we place gardens of date palms and grapevines therein and make springs flow forth. لِيَأْكُلُوا مِنْ سَمَرِهِ وَمَا عَمِلَتْهُ أَيْدِيهِمْ أَفَلَا يَشْكُرُوا That they may eat of it, of its fruit, and of that which their hands have worked, will they not then give thanks? And then this ayah concludes by سُبْحَانَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْأَزْوَاجَ كُلَّهَا Glory be unto him who has created the pairs, all of them. From what the earth makes grow, mimma tumbitul ardu, wa min anfusihim, wa mimma la yalamu, and from what they know not. That's the first sign. Wa ayatun lahum al ardu al maytah. The word ayah here means dalil, means proof. وَآيَةٌ And it's, there is tankir. It's an indefinite word. And this indefiniteness in the ayah is indicating to us that this is a major ayah, a mighty ayah. It's not a simple ayah. And if we go into the Arabic, we can grammatically analyze this this the first few words as what where is the subject and where is the predicate 
is ayah the subject or is ayah the predicate? lahum al ardul mayta. The ard mayta is the subject we're talking about. And ayah is the predicate. is what we're saying about this dead earth. That the dead earth is an ayah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the predicate before the subject. Uh, and we'll see why. وَآيَةٌ لَهُمْ الْأَرْضُ الْمَيْتَ And there is relevance between dead earth and dead people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can revive that earth. So why is it strange that he can't revive that people? وَآيَةٌ لَهُمْ الْأَرْضُ الْمَيْتَ أَحْيَيْنَاهَا The word أَحْيَيْنَاهَا revived it. This clarifies the meaning of ayah. Why is the dead earth an ayah? Because ahyaynaha. From this angle. So all these wonders of creation now here are cited as signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala greatness and as signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's oneness and as signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's perfection and wisdom and omnipotence. وَأَخْرَجْنَا أَخْرَجْنَا is, a, is another bounty, is another favor. Not only he revived the dead earth, but also brought forth from the dead earth حَبًّا grain. حَبًّا فَمِنْهُ يَأْكُلُونَ And the same thing is happening here. حَبًّا is nakira, is an indefinite word. And this tanween is a substitute for so many other words that the Arabic language prefer to omit instead of saying the obvious. And your mind will be able to fill in the blanks. Habban, all kinds of hab, all kinds of grains, especially the grains that act as a staple. وَأَخْرَجْنَا مِنْهَا حَبًّا فَمِنْهُ يَأْكُلُونَ فَمِنْهُ i.e. it's like they, they don't eat anything except hab, because hab is staple. Like without, without uh, wheat and barley and, and corn, uh, people life, um, they don't enjoy food. They don't enjoy their life. It's their staple. I know some people that say, if I can't eat bread every day, my life is miserable. Bread is essential. And, and when we find out that there, uh, uh, there is... Uh, shortage in, in wheat and barley and corn, uh, we say this is a difficult time. It's a difficult time not to have these things. وَجَعَلْنَا فِيهَا جَنَّاتٍ مِنْ نَخِيلٍ وَأَعْنَابٍ So Allah's ability, Allah's power to revive the earth is cited here as evidence for his ability to revive human beings after death. His ability to resurrect. And وَأَخْرَجْنَا وَآيَةٌ لَهُمُ الْأَرْضُ الْمَيْتَةُ أَحْيَيْنَاهَا وَأَخْرَجْنَا مِنْهَا وَأَخْرَجْنَا مِنْهَا This is, these are the grains and food that, by which people are nourished. Why? وَآيَةٌ لَهُمُ الْأَرْضُ الْمَيْتَةُ أَحْيَيْنَاهَا وَأَخْرَجْنَا مِنْهَا حَبًّا فَمِنْهُ يَأْكُلُونَ Why? لِيَأْكُلُوا مِنْ ثَمَرِهِ وَمَا عَمِلَتْهُ أَيْدِيهِمْ أَفَلَا يَشْكُرُونَ So that they eat from the fruits of the trees, they eat from the grains. وَمَا عَمِلَتْهُ أَيْدِيهِمْ And that which their hands have worked. So this word here, ma, we can interpret it as a relevant pronoun. 
or we can interpret it as an article of negation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, so that they eat, let me check the English translation, that they may eat of its fruit. Oh, it says, and we place gardens. Uh, we missed an ayah. وَجَعَلْنَا فِيهَا جَنَّاتٍ مِنْ نَخِيلٍ And we place gardens. We place in the earth gardens. جَنَّاتٍ The word jannat implies density, implies uh, anytime the word uh, these letters, the jim, the noon, are mentioned, implies um, if we were to say something, we ha I have a junaina, I have a garden. It means my garden is full of trees. And it's full of trees to the point that it hides you. If you were to walk in the junaina, for, and if, you were, if you were to walk in the garden, I may not be able to see you because of the density of the trees. And from this word, we also have the word jinn. The jinn are called jinn because we can't see them, they're, they're hidden. And the word jannah is where it's full of trees. And the word janin, the embryo, is hidden in the womb of, its mo of his mother. So this idea, jannatin, implies density, and implies something becomes hidden because of this density. وَجَعَلْنَا فِيهَا جَنَّاتٍ مِنْ نَخِيلٍ وَأَعْنَابٍ And we place gardens of date palms trees and grapevines, أَعْنَابٍ We notice that in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the trees of date palms. But in the أَعْنَاب mentions the fruits, not the trees. And the commentators mention that in the case of the date palm trees, everything in the date palm tree is beneficial, including the tree, including the leaves, including the inside of the tree, including the date palms themselves. While in the case of anab, only the fruits are beneficial. The grapevine itself is not of benefit. And the word anab is used in the plural because there are like 25 kinds and species of anab. And the words of nakhil is also used in the plural because there are over 4,000 species of, of dates. وَجَعَلْنَا فِيهَا جَنَّاتٍ مِنْ نَخِيلٍ وَأَعْنَابٍ وَفَجَّرْنَا فِيهَا مِنَ الْعُيُونَ وَفَجَّرْنَا فِيهَا مِنَ الْعُيُونَ and we make springs flow forth. Uh, in the other translation, it says, and made burst forth therein offsprings, i.e. some of the springs. This is important because here this ayah is telling us that there are so many string, springs in the earth but the springs that we have access to are only few. So the resources Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed in the earth are so many. Like in وَفَجَّرْنَا فِيهَا مِنَ الْعُيُونَ Some of the springs. مِنَ الْعُيُونَ Not all عُيُون. Not all springs. And when we read the story of Nuh alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَفَجَّرْنَا الْأَرْضَ عُيُونًا The whole earth became عُيُون, became springs. All the, uh, the veins, because these عُيُون, they act like veins inside the earth. It's like our bodies have veins of blood. The earth has veins of water flowing through it. And it's a network. It's like a world wide web. It's a web of, of springs that flow inside the earth following a very precise system that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created. But not all of these springs show up and gush forth from the earth. Only a few of them. So we should never despair that this earth, although we're 
contaminating the earth. And man is not able to manage the earth properly. We should not despair. There are many springs also that are still hidden. And perhaps with time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his mercy, these springs may come so that we can use them. Why did we do this? Why did we place? Why did we place gardens? And why did we place springs? Because, as you know, vegetations need a lot of water. In this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِيَأْكُلُوا مِنْ سَمَرِهِ That they may eat of its fruits and what their own hands then prepare. This translation is based on the assumption that ma is a relevant, is a, is a relative pronoun. Is a relative pronoun. So we can look at this ayah in terms of time. لِيَأْكُلُوا مِنْ سَمَرِهِ لِيَأْكُلُوا مِنْ سَمَرِهِ That they may eat of its fruits. So up to the time where the fruits become ripe on, on the trees, this is the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Up to that point, it's a creation of Allah. And if we take the next uh, statement, the next relative uh, clause as, وَمَا عَمِلَتْ وَأَيْدِيهِمْ As negation, i.e. they have nothing to do with this. The farmers, all they do is prepare the land and do the best, but the seeds, the way they split inside the earth, the way they grow, is the act of God alone. And if we take it as a relative pronoun, then it's talking about beyond that time. So from the moment the seed is placed in the earth up to the fruits becoming ripe and ready to eat, is referring now to what you do with these fruits. It says here that they might eat of its fruits, i.e. that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created alone, and what their own hands then prepare. So we take the fruits and we make, make a drink out of fruits. We make jams. We make oil, olive oil. We take the olives and make oil. We make vinegar out of grapes. We and what their own hand then prepare. So in terms of time, is refer to the time after the fruits are ripe, become became ripe. Will they not even show thanks? سُبْحَانَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْأَزْوَاجَ كُلَّهَا مِمَّا تُنْبِتُ الْأَرْضُ وَمِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ Subhana, glorious, glorious and gloriously exalted, beyond limit. Subhana الَّذِي is He خَلَقَ الْأَزْوَاجَ who created all pairs of beings entirely, كُلَّهَا Everything is created in pairs. What the earth grows. And of themselves. And of what they do not know. Things that we, we have no idea. We are not aware of these pairs. I.e., here, the, this ayah is inviting us to glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also stating Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is far remote from all the imperfections that the disbelievers may ascribe to him. Because the word subhana is what we call in Arabic maf'ul mutlaq. It's an absolute object. I.e. Sabbih Subhana. Sabbih Allah Subhana. It's a command to the believers to declare his transcendence and 
to declare that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is exalted. So there is an imperative verb that is omitted, commanding all believers and all people to glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to declare his tasbih, that he is far above any imperfections or even any perfection that we may think that they're perfection but they're not worthy of, of his majesty. And this ayah is also telling us that the, the idea of uh, azwaj is in everything in this universe. It exists in humans, we have male and female. It exists in animals, it exists in vegetations. It exists in electricity, we have positive and negative. It exists in magnetism. It exists in electrons, it exists in protons, it exists even in cells. It exists even in things we don't even know about, we're not aware of. That there's a binary system. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is non-binary. That's the first ayah. The second sign is a bit, it's very interesting, the second sign. وَآيَةٌ لَهُمُ اللَّيْلُ نَسْلَخُ مِنْهُ النَّهَارَ فَإِذَا هُمْ مُظْلِمُونَ وَالشَّمْسُ تَجْرِي لِمُسْتَقَرِّ لَهَا ذَلِكَ تَقْدِيرُ الْعَزِيزِ الْعَلِيمِ وَالْقَمَرَ قَدَّرْنَاهُ مَنَازِلَ حَتَّى عَادَكَ الْعُرْجُونِ الْقَدِيمِ لَالشَّمْسُ يَنْبَغِي لَهَا أَنْ تُدْرِكَ الْقَمَرَ وَلَا اللَّيْلُ سَابِقُ النَّهَارَ وَكُلٌّ فِي فَلَكٍ يَسْبَحُونَ وَآيَةٌ لَهُمْ Same thing. وَآيَةٌ لَهُمْ And a mighty sign unto them is the night. We strip the day therefrom. And behold, they are in darkness. The word salakh is usually used for animals when you skin their skin, when you strip their skin from their flesh. Because the skin is a very thin layer covering the animal. وَآيَةٌ لَهُمُ اللَّيْلُ نَسْلَخُ مِنْهُ النَّهَارِ So what's the default? Is the default night or is the default the day? The default is darkness. The default is the night. وَآيَةٌ لَهُمُ اللَّيْلُ نَسْلَخُ مِنْهُ النَّهَارِ Nahar, the daylight, is this very thin layer that, that's maybe about 200 kilometers thick. That's it. And beyond this layer of 200 kilometers, darkness all over. وَآيَةٌ لَهُمُ اللَّيْلُ نَسْلَخُ مِنْهُ النَّهَارِ فَإِذَا هُمْ مُظْلِمُونَ The layer of daylight is only, it's, it's, a, it's very limited. And there is, there is a parable that's, drawn here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is likening likening this layer of daylight to the skin of an animal. When an animal dies, the skin is the animal is skinned. And the skin of the animal is very thin. And darkness and the night is a default. And daylight is an accident. It's not the asal, it's a'arid. But the idea also, naslakhu minun nahar, i.e. it happens gradually. Because when you skin an animal, you skin it gradually. There's a gradual, the night goes away gradually. And daylight shows the beauty of the earth. At night, we don't see the beauty of the earth. We don't see the beauty of creation. But daylight shows us this beauty. 
Minhu is different than Anhu. He did not, he did not say Naslahu Anhu. Because had it said Anhu, it means night and day are completely exclusive. But Minhu is like it's a part of it. Naslahu Minhu Nahar. It's like it's inside it and then you remove it and eliminate it. Fa'iza hum Muslimun. And lo, they are in darkness because that's the asal, that's the origin, that's the default. Or as someone says, Al kawnu kulluhu zulma. Wa ayatun lahumu laylu naslahu minhu naha. Fa iza hum muslimun. Wa shamsu tajri li mustakarri laha. i.e. a mighty sign unto them is the sun as well a mighty sun unto them is the night a mighty sun unto them is the sun tajri the word tajri anytime this word jarayan is used, it implies quickness, it implies speed, it implies it happens quickly. It, it doesn't take its time. It's going at a, at a, uh, at a high speed. Now in the old days, the idea that the sun is tajri, or relatively in the 20th century, they say, no, 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 the sun doesn't move. The sun is fixed. The earth is the one is where it moves. But today we know different. We know that the sun has five jarayan, has five states of jarayan. And the idea of jarayan is like it's running away. It's running away. It's like when you have a child run away from home. It's like it's running away. Washamsu tajri. So it's, it's running away very quickly, very fast. Tajri is using the mudara verb. Mudara verb implies repetition, i.e. it's always happening. Because this sun is inside the galaxy, the galaxy is moving, which is inside the super galaxy, which is moving. They're moving at very high speed in this universe. وَالشَّمْسُ تَجْرِي لِي مُسْتَقَرِّ لَهَا Now this letter lamb, it could mean the lamb of the starting point, or it could mean the lamb of the raya, which is the end point. Uh, and if we take the lamb as the end point, i.e., tajri li rayatiha, al mustaqar li mustaqarin, this mustaqar becomes its, its end goal, its end target. And mustaqar is more emphatic than makar. Makar also implies the end target. But mustaqar is the, the ultimate end. The ultimate end. I.e., there will come a time when the sun will reach that end as it moves. And when it reaches that end at a particular time or at a particular point in space and time, which is... And this point is completely, completely belongs to the unseen. When it reaches that point, that's when the day of judgment will come. Because it arrives at that point, and that's its end, and that's the time where this whole universe will be destroyed. وَالشَّمْسُ تَجْرِي لِمُسْتَقَرِّ اللَّهِ ذَلِكَ تَقْدِيرُ The idea of تَقْدِيرُ Taqdeer implies precise measurement. Everything is measured in a precise way. Taqdeer of whom? Al-Aziz, Al-Anim. Al-Aziz, i.e. the one who nothing can overpower him. He overpowers everything. He's almighty. His word is law. His act is law. Al-Alim. Everything is done with precise alim. 
he knows he put the sun on a, on a, on a, on a course and this course is governed by precise rules and precise system. And miqdar in maqsus, specific miqdar, specific wawajh in maqsus, in agreement with the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we take this to be the lamb of beginning, not the lamb of end, وَالشَّمْسُ تَجْرِي لِمُسْتَقَرِّ لَهَا لِمُسْتَقَرِّ لَهَا i.e. every day, every month, every year, the sun is, is starting. It's a starting point for the sun. And this can get confusing sometimes for us. Because there is also a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that the sun, as it moves, every day it asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what should I do next? So it prostrates before Allah and it asks him, what should, I, should I continue or should I stop? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow it to continue and to keep on appearing, to keep on appearing. And as it reaches its end, then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give it the, the final command, and if we take the lamb as the lamb of beginning, actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Rabbul Mashriqaini wa Rabbul Maghribain. And also says Rabbul Mashariqi wal Maghrib. Because what appears to us as sunset is actually sunrise for other people. What, what sunset for us, as the sun sets for us, it starts to rise on the other end. And also, the sun never rises from the same point twice. It always rises from a different point. Rabbul Mashariqi wa Rabbul Maghrib. Wa shamsu tajri li mustaqarrin laha. In the beginning of the 20th century, when one of the commentators started writing their commentary, the philosophers used to poke at them. They say, you guys say that al-jibala arsaha, jibal are like nails and pegs in the earth. You guys say that as shamsu tajri. No, as shams doesn't tajri. <laughs> as shams is fixed, doesn't tajri. And now they're silent, they can't say this anymore. وَالْقَمَرَ قَدَّرْنَاهُ مَنَازِلَ حَتَّى عَادَكَ الْعُرْجُونِ الْقَدِيمِ Here is the word Qamar. والقمر قدرناه منازلة. Let's finish these two ayahs and stop, and then we'll open the floor for questions. والقمر قدرناه منازلة حتى عاد كالعجون القديم. In Arabic also we see القمر has فتحة on it. Is what we call منصوب. It's in a state of of um, it's a grammatical state. Um, that is usually used for objects, not for doers. Not for the doers of the verb, but the object of the verb. But we could have said, well, Qamaru was Dhamma, and then it becomes a subject. So, in Arabic, um, where you place your, your focus and ihtimam affects the grammatical rule. So if I were to say, well, Qamaru, it means I'm focusing on the, on the moon. I'm focusing on the Qamar. But if I say, well, Qamara, it's, it's an object now. I'm no longer focusing on the Qamar. I'm, fo I'm focusing on, well, Qamara qaddarnahu. I'm focusing on the act of God, on the act of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yani, at-tarkizu ala fi'li Allahi. وَالسَّمَاءَ رَفَعَهَا التركيز على من رفع السماء مع الاهتمام بالسماء the, the emphasis here is on, the, on Allah's act it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is قَدَّرَ الْقَمَرَ منازل. and at the same time we 
put the object of the verb before the verb to also indicate that there is also importance. This kamar is not like uh, something little, it's something very valuable and very precious. So, at-tarkizu ala fa'li allahi ma'a l-ahtimami bil-qamar. Wal-qamar qaddarnahu manazila hatta aada kal-urjuni al-qadim. Here is making, uh, is likening al-qamar to the branch of the date palm tree. Once you take away the date palms, the branch, before it was heavy, there was a heavy load on it. And now the load is gone. And over time, it becomes skinnier and skinnier, and it becomes ancient, becomes old. And it takes on this, this curve, curvature. It becomes curved, like the moon, like the crescent. وَالْقَمَرَ قَدَّرْنَاهُ مَنَازِلَ حَتَّى عَادَكَ الْعُرْجُونِ الْقَدِيمِ So the, the verse here is, is, um, is a reference to the waning of the moon through the 28 uh, stations, manazil, uh, in a single month, in a single lunar month. Like an old palm stalk, like so this is a reference to what remains of a date cluster. When you take the dates out, the cluster and the branches, as they get old, they become skinnier, and then they, they start resembling the, the crescent. And they resemble the thin crescent uh, moon in shape, uh, in, in width, and also in color. And then here it says, لا الشمس ينبغي لها أن تدرك القمر ولا الليل سابق النهار. لا الشمس ينبغي لها أن تدرك القمر ولا الليل سابق النهار. وكل في فلك يسبحون. كل this idea of كل again comes. It's indefinite. So it talks about the shams and the qamar. It says, wa kullun. And not just the shams, the moon, and the sun. Kullun. All other planets, all other stars. And all of these omitted words are substituted with a tanween, with a tankir. Lashamsu yambari laha an tudrika al qamar. The word that is used here is yambari. And yambari comes from bari. From bari when you oppress something, when you when somebody Something, somebody who is an oppressor is called Bari, or someone who trans transgresses the bound is called Bari. And with the, uh, uh, this word also connotes the idea of mutawa. Mutawa, i.e., you, you comply with what, what I want. You cannot refuse what I, what I do. He said, لَشَّمْسُ yambari لَهَا أَن تُدْرِكَ الْقَمَرِ the sun it befits not the sun to overtake the moon nor the night to outstrip the day each glides in an orbit the sun could never overtake the moon nor night ever outstrip the day. And each courses in a mighty round. Because the path of the sun is different than the path of the moon. Well, Laylu Sabiqun Nahar. It befits not, the night can never outstrip the day. I.e., it cannot compete with it and replaces it and takes its place. So, so the way the ayah starts also is always by the 
by the default or al aqwa the more strong so al shamsu la shamsu yanbaghi laha an tudrik al qamar because the shams is stronger than the moon wala al laylu sabiq al nahar and the night is stronger or the asal or the default or the origin of, and and daylight is is uh, temporary وكلن, this is an indication of all other stars and all other planets and did not say kilahuma he did not say he says وكلن. because here we have the sun and the moon in Arabic as you know we have singular dual and plural and here we only have two things الشمس والقمر did not say وكلاهما وكل في فلك يسبحون did not say يسبحان i.e. dual he used the plural يسبحون plural i.e. it's more than two it's an indication to other planets and stars. And not only that, it used the verb yasbahun as if it's a rational being. Because if it's uh, inanimate object, you say yasbahna. Yasbahun is only people who can think and make decision on their own. وَكُلٌّ فِي فَلَكٍ يسبحون. So Imam Razi here mentions that uh, Yasbahun is like the sun knows where it's going. There is a, there's a course that is set for it. The moon knows where it's going. The night knows its limit. The daylight knows. It's like they know because there is a precise rule and precise laws that govern, that govern them. Um, so a metaphor is used as to um, to think of them as as rational beings like as you and me know where we're going because the sun and the moon they always go in the same place and they know where to go it's like they know the path they need to take every day on every point in time that's the second sign and the third sign وَآيَةٌ لَهُمْ أَنَّا حَمَلْنَا ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ فِي الْفُلْكِ الْمَشْحُونَ and a mighty sign unto them is that we bore their seed in the fully laden ark. Inshallah, we'll stop here. Wassalamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Any questions? Maybe we can take one or two questions because we kept you. Tfadda uh, Yeah, so far we, they only know about. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yes. Uh, I was just reflecting on the word when you said about the ayat 36. I read the first five. 33. Thirty-four and thirty-three. Yeah. 
وَجَعَلْنَا فِيهَا جَنَّاتٍ مِنْ نَخِيلٍ وَعَنَمٍ These are examples. These are examples. Examples of hab. Because hab also includes wheat, includes barley, includes whatever, includes hummus, includes dates, includes. And also, لِيَأْكُلُوا um, مِنْ سَمَرِهِ The summer includes anab, includes dates as well. Because food, we have four categories of food. We have, we have something called like the main course, like staple. These are foods, these are items of food that you cannot do without. Like in iftar time, you need to have biryani, right? This is a staple. That's a staple. And then we have uh, other items that um, beautify the food or adds more flavor to the food, like spices. Again, biryani. So that's, this is a different kind of item. And then we have food that's, uh, uh, that we call fruits. They're not staple, they're not spices, they're fruits. And we have a fourth type of category of food that uh, you know, are called baklava or called ulab uh, jamnum or something. These are desserts uh, or chocolate cake. The uh, food is usually classified under these four categories. So uh, spices, we cannot live on spices. Uh, we cannot live on fruits completely unless maybe you're a small percentage maybe you'll be able to do that. Desserts, the same thing, you cannot live on desserts. But the first category of food is what we depend on for our continuation of life. You need bread, you need rice, you need meat, you need or something that of the same kind. And these also are reflected in fiqh, like in the Islamic law, they're reflected. Even in the hadith about riba, al-burru bil-burri, it's talking about staples. Al-milhu bil-milhi, talking about different kind of food. What tamru bil tamri, talking about different kind of food, fruits. So we see the fuqaha, also the ulama, um, they are always paying attention to the universe. Because Allah lahu al khalqu wal amr. The khalq, the creation, is the act of Allah. And the amr is the words of Allah. And the words of Allah cannot contradict the act of Allah, and no vice versa. So sometimes the, the ulama recommends also to understand the aims of the sharia. You also need to understand the aims of creation. Why are we created? Like maqasid al khalq, the aims and the objectives behind creation. Because at the end, you're applying the Sharia on the creation. So if you don't know the aims of the creation, your application or your understanding will be incomplete, to say the least, and sometimes maybe deficient. Does that help? Yeah. All these ayat really look like, like, it's mashallah, it's like completely a scientific way of looking at things from the uh -huh. ayat onwards. Like, if you look at the earth, the dead earth, you think it's, they're like rocks. The trees become dead, they're like... But because we get used to it, we see it every year. Every year, spring comes and the earth is revived again. Because we get used to it, we take it for granted. But if we were, let's say the earth wasn't like this. Assume the earth was created in a different way, that it's always like this. And then it dies. Then the following year, let's say the earth comes back to life, we say, oh my God, look what happened. This is unusual. Because of repetition, uh, it became obvious to us. But if it wasn't for repetition, everything is a miracle. Because of repetition, we get used to it. And sometimes we say, this is obvious. So we ask, why is it obvious? What's the origin of, being, of it being obvious? Sometimes the origin of, being, of it being obvious is because of repetition. Like one plus one equal two, but eight times eight equals 64. 
to me, 8 times 8 equals 64 is obvious now. But it wasn't obvious when I started learning math. But because of repetition, 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 11 times 11 equals 121. 12 times 12 equals 144. This is obvious. may not be obvious for other people. So obvious has different meanings depending on the whether depending on the discipline, depending on the science one is studying. The same thing here, if, if we were created in a way that every year we die, that some animals hibernate, let's say every year we die, or we become like rocks, we become immovable objects. And then uh, in winter we die, and then in spring water falls and we start, we start uh, becoming alive again. We get used to it. If it happens every year, we get used to it. But since we're not like the trees, uh, we think uh, if it were to happen to us now, we think this is a miracle. This is like very unusual. It's outside the norm of, of what is normal. That's why the ulama defined marjiza or, or a miracle as amrun kharikun lil ada. Is a, is a matter that goes beyond what people are used to, the habits. Not amrun kharikun lil They do not say that a miracle is something that is illogical. No, they don't. That's not the definition. A miracle is something that we're not used to. We're not used to. Hmm. It's indicated in many verses in the Quran. Yeah. Tfadl, tfadl. Yes, yes. So there are three things that are paired with all things um, that are for all schools and within you and that you do not know. So all of what I'm trying to say to you is that one person said to me gender. So gender is not paired, right? But there are life forms that are single gender. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Okay. 